So should we wait for more participants to join in or should we start? We can start. You can begin. Yes. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm Harpreet Kaur from Plant and Food Research New Zealand. And tonight and or today I'm gonna be your moderator. So welcome to the second webinar of the Ecophotomics Harvest Webinars series. Uh, this is the second webinar and it comprises of four lectures and that will be in English with Japanese subtitles. Each lecture will be around 15 minutes and five minutes will be given for discussions. So you can have questions. You can type in your questions in the chat box and at the end of the lecture, I will read that question and we can have an open discussion. Um, but before that, I would like to thank Professor Sinkova, my dear friend Yelena, for giving me this opportunity to be the moderator. And many thanks and gratitude to the foundations, Sukino Sizuko Foundation, for their tremendous support in publishing the first aquaphotomic special issue. And in general, their support for aquaphotomics research projects and publications. And I would also like to tell um, everyone that the lecture will be recorded. And by the end of, in few days, the lecture will be available on echophotomics.com website. You will get a message from Yelena or Lawrence. Now, we are going to start with the first presenter. And the first presenter is from my country, New Zealand, uh, Damon Raj Rajkumar. So Damon Raj Rajkumar is a PhD student um, in the University of Otago in New Zealand. You know, University of Otago is in the South Island in New Zealand and is also the part of uh, my research team, um, Applied Sensors team at Plant and Food Research New Zealand. His PhD topics topic involves the use of polarized light and near infrared spectroscopy to measure fruit internal quality. Now talking about the title of Damon's presentation, it is interactions of linearly polarized and unpolarized light on kiwi fruit using aquaphotomics. Uh, you will get the link to his presentation in the chat box if you want to see the paper. So Lawrence, would you please be able to start the video? Hello everyone, my name is Damon and I'm a PhD student studying at the University of Otago alongside Plant and Food Research. The topic I'm discussing today is on the interactions of linearly polarized and non-polarized light on kiwi fruit using aquaphotomics. So for a quick overview, I'll first go over the objective of this research and explain the purpose of this work before delving into the methodology of this research. And after acquiring spectra from the experiment, we'll use pre-processing techniques and principal component analysis to determine the water matrix coordinates. And this will then be used to generate the echograms for linearly polarized and non-polarized light. So a bit of a background, near infrared spectroscopy or NIRS is a popular technique for sorting fruits in terms of its soluble solids content, SSC and dry matter content, DMC. There are however room for improvement and possibly new directions for this technique. And one possible direction is investigating a fundamental property of light called the polarization of light. The polarization of light describes the oscillation of the electric field along a defined plane. And studies using polarized light in fruit are few, and it's possibly due to the multiple scattering of light in biological tissue. But it may be 
prove to be useful. And so in the study, the objective of this study then is to measure linearly polarized, non-polarized light on yellow flash kiwi fruit under two different configurations. And these are unpeeled or intact fruit and peeled or sliced kiwi fruit. And then using the aquaphotomics approach, we will investigate the effects that these configurations have of polarized and non-polarized light in the 800 to 1050 nanometer range. So for the methodology, a total of 200 kiwi fruits were used in this experiment. And these are measured in a 22 degree Celsius room. In the first step, we have two ring adapters, two custom made ring adapters, which were used with the F75, which was developed by the Felix Instruments. And this is a handheld NIRS instrument. The ring adapter is then used to house the linear polarizer. And then the unpeeled fruit is then measured with and without the polarizer before it is sliced using a commercial meat slicer. And in the step two, two millimeter slices are sliced off each fruit before wrapping and cling wrap to reduce moisture loss. The same process is then done on the peel fruit to measure the unpolarized and polarized light spectra. And this is then again wrapped and transported to another room to measure the soluble solids content using an Otago refractometer. And once we have the absorbent spectra calculated, we then apply the standard normal variate or SNV transformation. And also the savitsky golay second derivative method with a seven nanometer filter window width and a second order polynomial smoothing. A higher window width may wash out any interesting features that we might observe in the spectra. We also use the SSC difference spectra by assigning an either a low, medium, or high designation to each kiwi fruit. We also use the principal components analysis to reduce dimensionality and simplify interpretation of all kiwi fruit absorbents. We then use the corresponding loading and score plots of the first three principal components to explain variances of all configurations. And these were used to determine the water matrix coordinates, which are sensitive to perturbations of the water structure. Once selected, we then we then use we then have equigrams which are generated using the water matrix coordinates wavelengths using a relative standard normal variate transformation shown by this equation here, where A lambda is the pre-process absorbance value for a sample at wavelength lambda and mu and sigma are the mean and standard deviation of the pre-process absorbance values across all configurations at their specific wavelength. So as a side note, the linear polarizer is an optical component that transmits electromagnetic wave in one plane and absorbs the rest shown by the simple uh, setup here where the unpolarized light passes through a polarizer and only one, the one plane of linearly polarized light is produced whereas the other random oscillations are absorbed by the polarizer. And then in this experiment, only copolarized light was measured and we call this the polarizer configuration. And this composes of two components, I parallel and I perpendicular. I parallel refers to light that has undergone a few scattering events. And this is mainly contributed by light which with hash which has maintained its polarization state. Whereas the purple and I perpendicular refer to light that has undergone multiple scattering events and so would have been depolarized while traveling inside the fruit tissue. And so this graph here shows the absorbance plot for each configuration, where blue refers to UP, which is the unpeeled polarized, red refers to UU, which is the unpeeled unpolarized. PP is the cyan, refers to the peeled polarized, and PU is the peeled unpolarized. And then for the absorbent spectra, the solid line refers to the average spectra with the field areas representing the average plus or minus, plus and minus the standard deviation. For the peel configure 
configurations, there is an increase in absorbance uh, due to the removal of skin. And this has been previously observed in another study on peeled and unpeeled apples. The polarizer had a substantial decrease compared to the unpolarized light. And but this is not this is not surprising given the intensity is reduced when passing light through a polarizer. Yes, and retransformation then reveal clear separation between polarized and unpolarized spectra. As the polarizer exhibited a slight broadening in the water peak at about 970 nanometers. And this can be related to the lower penetration depth of copolarized light compared with unpolarized light. And we also took the second derivative of the SNV absorbance from the previous slide, where we observed differences between copolarized and unpolarized measurements. And one is the reduction of the second derivative absorbance at 942 nanometers from unpolarized to polarized light. Another interesting feature is the flattening from 970 to 1000 nanometers for polarized light configurations, where in general, and in general, the peel configurations have a higher second derivative absorbance at 942 nanometers, which we attribute to the complex kiwi fruit skin. We also apply the principal component analysis to the SNV and second derivative spectra and plotted the maxima and minima wavelengths in the 900 to 1020 nanometer range for each principal component. We note that over 95% of variance is captured by the first three principal components with a clear separation between polarized and unpolarized for the score plots. And so in the score plots, every 200 samples refers to a new configuration, where UP again is the unpeeled polarized, you use a unpeeled unpolarized, PP is a peeled polarized, and PU is a peeled unpolarized. And that there is a tendency for the peel configurations to shift downwards, which appears to be caused by the negative correlation at 946 nanometers. And this corresponds to the free water state S0, S0 described as water molecules with their free OH functional groups. Separation between polarization states, polarization states shifted positively for 965 nanometers, which refers to water molecules bonded with one hydrogen bond. Other trends were in the other two principal components were not so obvious. And then by taking the SNV and second derivative absorbance, we can calculate the average SSC difference spectra for all groups by subtracting from the average spectra of the low SSC group. And for each key referred, we group, group in under low, medium, or high SSC. And this is determined by the Otago refractometer BRICS value, whereas 7 to 11.9% BRICS refer to low SSC, 12.1 to 14.9% BRICS refers to medium SSC and 15 to 20.5% bricks refer to high SSC. And these all have relatively similar uh, numbers of kiwi fruits. And so differences occur for the polarized configurations. Differences occur at 946 and 965 nanometers, while for unpolarized components, differences occur at 949 and 968 nanometers where there are extra features at 975 and 978 for unpeeled and polarized, which may be caused by the UV fruit skin. And we consider all the maxima and minima in each configuration when selecting the water matrix coordinates. So this table is a summary of the important water matrix coordinates, which are based on the water bands. And these are calculated using an N-harmonic oscillator model for the second overtone of water. C1 to C5 are related to free water species, and C6 to C12 are related to bound water species. And so using the PCA results, we have activated wavelengths from within each pens, which are identified at 916 nanometers, and 946, 965, 988, 
1007 and 1014 nanometers. And they're using the average difference as a C spectra from the previous slide. We have activated wavelengths at 903 nanometers, 975 and 994 nanometers. By using the SNV and the second derivative spectra, we have activated wavelengths at 926, 933, and 962 nanometers. And so an equigram of all configurations is shown in this spider plot here, where it suggests that polarized light have a high, relatively greater absorbance at free water states from C1 to C5 compared to unpolarized light, which relatively favors the bound water states from C6 to C10. The exception occurs at C11 and C12, where polarized light configurations exhibited a relatively greater absorbance than unpolarized light. C11 and C12 are closely related to strongly bonded hydrogen water molecules. So it is possible that these water structures could be polarization dependent, but currently there is no explanation on why absorbance of C12 for unpeeled polarized is higher than peeled polarized configuration and vice versa for C11. The peeled configurations have relatively greater absorbance for bound water states than the unpeeled configurations. And so we expect that polarized light is quickly depolarized in biological materials such as fruit tissues due to multiple scattering. And that within one millimeter, uh, after light has traveled one millimeter into fruit tissue, the water interactions between polarized and unpolarized light are quite similar. So any differences that we observe between polarized and unpolarized could be due to the near surface region of fruit and the relatively shorter path length of the polarized light. There is also potential for polarization sensitive structures such as cellulose and starch, which may cause differences between unpolarized and linearly polarized light. And because the second overtone of water contains mixtures of absorbances from all these structures, it may be difficult to differentiate the, these differences using between polarized and unpolarized to conventional means. And so similar equigram patterns were produced for all configurations irrespective of the SSC group. And so when we group between the low, medium and high for each configuration, it looked very similar. And the alignment with the free water species C1 to C5 decreases, decreased with the bound water species C6 to C11, increasing as the average SSC increases. And this is similar to a previous work involving SSC grouping. And the equigram suggests that differences between polarized and unpolarized responses were not related to SSC at all. And there is no explanation why, but it is worth noting that at C6 from the low to high SSC group, the relative absorbance decreased for the for the unpolarized light, whereas it stays the same for the polarized light con configurations. So in conclusion, there, is, there are clear differences between polarized and unpolarized when we're looking at the absorbance patterns, but less so between the unpeeled and peeled configuration. Differences in fruit SSC didn't really appear to be a major factor associated with these differences. And that under an aquaphotomics framework, there was a suggestion that bound water states absorb more unpolarized light than polarized light. And it is speculated that differences are due to polarization sensitive structures, particularly in the near surface layers. And then further work is needed to investigate and explain these differences in response due to the polarization state of light. And so before I conclude, I would like to acknowledge my supervisors and co-authors, Dr. Reiner, Dr. Harpreet, Dr. Jevon, and Dr. Andrew. And that for the paper that I wrote, I would like to thank the, my academic editors, Dr. Rumiana and Dr. Yelena. And I'm also quite grateful for the funding received by the Tsukino Shizuku Foundation and the PhD funding from Planet Food Research. And thank you for listening.
thank you very much, Damon. Uh, unfortunately, Damon is not present tonight because he is busy with writing his PhD thesis. So the floor is open for questions and I have received few questions from Professor Yelena and Professor Annabel. Um, I will try to answer those questions, but in case the question is uh, aiming for Damon, then I will pass the question to Damon. Uh, the first question is uh, from Yelena. How did you come to the idea to use polarized light? That is really a very good question. Um, uh, we actually found that um, in most of the handheld instruments or the near infrared spectrophotometers, uh, we use polarized, unpolarized light. And the main purpose of the spectrometer uh, is to predict the quality of fruit or any other uh, biological tissue. But in our case at Plant and Food Research, we basically work with food quality assessment. Uh, we wanted to see um, if we are using polarized light, whether polarized light can improve the quality protection of fruit, whether it improves the signal that passes through the skin into the flesh of the fruit. So that was the main idea to use the polarized light. Um, so in, in Damon's PhD thesis, he's trying to explain a bit more uh, what he has found so far. So when he finishes his PhD thesis, do read his PhD thesis. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Harpreet. Yeah, and the question uh, from Professor Annabel is polarized light is depolarizing biological material. And the reason is uh, because of the skin and the material which is present in the in the flesh and the skin, which is um, the, the scattering material, basically. It's the starch, the cell walls, which acts as biofringent. So when the polarized light passes through the tissue, uh, it becomes depolarized. That is what Damon also explained in, in his presentation. We, we were trying to speculate what were the reasons why we couldn't get um, good results with polarized light. Mm -hmm. I would like to, just to comment uh, on this because uh, I found it interesting that I didn't see this before. I didn't realize, but now when um, I saw the presentation, I found it very interesting that um, uh, Dim says uh, so uh, the pol the absorbance at C six water matrix coordinate stays the mm -hmm. same uh, for the polarized light. Uh, yeah, it doesn't depend on this SSC actually, and mm. it is interesting that this is, um, a, as far as I know, uh, a hydration water uh, band. Uh, most um, in most cases we associate that with a uh, mm. like a primary hydration shell of proteins. So I found it, that this is very interesting that this is a sort of like polarized light keeps this structure intact. And yeah. I know I was interested um, in polarized light earlier because I found that it is used uh, uh, in some some companies produce equipment which mm -hmm. are um, with uh, linearly polarized light, which uh, then is used for wound healing or promotion of healing. So this was really interesting to see in 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 this work. So I, I yeah, because it doesn't comment. affect the protein structure, polarized light. Seems, that is yes. why. Mm. Yeah, so it would be it's, interesting. I think maybe I mean this in this work you just presented about uh, soluble solid content. But for example, if you are you know like developing models for for example quantification of proteins or mm. sugars, how how that how that sh changes, how that affects results, that would be interesting. I'm I'm sorry yeah. that Damon is not here. I would like to ask more questions about the content he of is. this PhD. <laughs> if, yeah, if you have uh, more questions, do do write those questions and I will pass those questions I will. to them. I will. Yeah. And maybe we could organize again a webinar about that, that topic because this yeah. is quite interesting. Sure. Uh, we have one more question from Professor Enable. <laughs> yes. Um, in regard to the, to the question of uh, Jelena and uh, of myself, uh, 
in order to clarify what is the meaning of the polarization in biological systems, uh, I have two questions or two comments. Mm -hmm. First, if it is, a, it is possible to distinguish which are the cell components that can uh, uh, be uh, the, the, the cause of that uh, depolarization. And second, if uh, how uh, uh, the polarization of light is uh, related with the type of water that you may found in the system, such as water of hydration or uh, water that is uh, not uh, so tightly bound, bound to, the, to the chemical groups of the cell components. Can you make a comment about that? Um. I if think I, I would like. To, I <laughs> yeah, I think I would like to pass this question to Damon. Um, uh, Damon would be the better person to answer okay. these questions. Um, yeah, please write your question in the chat box so that I can and pass it to Damon. Okay. Yeah, that would be great.